with historians and our participant numbers are rapidly rising. So um, I was gonna say, uh, Varsha, you always have kind of one of the best backgrounds, um, always, but uh, <laughs> Laura, like you're, you're giving her a run for her money. I mean, that is a wall of books. I love the right bookshelves. There. This is, this is my real background, not a green screen. And okay. you know, the best part is all the books like tucked in every which way and like falling out the sides. And of course, this is the, this is the neatest part of the bookshelf because it's, <laughs> you know, the, but yeah. there's, there's more chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I feel looks... that there are, yeah, there are places in my room that no one can see that are just um, filled with books. I had an old roommate of mine complain um, when I was sharing a living room with her. She was like, Varsha, I really hate how you double stack and sometimes quadruple stack your bookshelves. It's, <laughs> it doesn't look good. And I was like, well, we're in college. No one's judging our interior design skills. <laughs> no, it just means you have a lot of books. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We need bigger houses is what it is. So um, yeah. my, uh, my wife was on a Zoom call earlier and um, she has behind her set up like another bookcase and stuff like that. And somebody actually asked her like, are those real books? I want you to touch them. And she's like, <laughs> okay. I, so. I will not be turning around to touch my books because I might <laughs> start an avalanche of, you know, whatever's stacked back there. But yes, they are as real as real can be. I, mis I misleadingly, well, it's true. I, you know, told my husband how lucky he was not to marry a woman who was into jewelry or, you know, expensive gifts, but I have cost him <laughs> over the years <laughs> and myself plenty. All right, well, so to, should we get going? Introduce Let's, everybody. Please. Yeah, That's to introduce what? everybody to our guests. So this week we have uh, Professor L.D. Burnett and she is an American historian of uh, American thought and culture. She's the editor of the, I wanna get this right, uh, U.S. Intellectual History blog. Um, and her most recent project, the one she's working on right now, or she has a book on um, Western civilization and the culture wars during the 1980s. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to her because I've been Twitter friends with uh, her for a while now. So I'm really pumped to talk about her, especially talk with her, especially considering the recent discussions about um, the role in history, uh, the role that history has to play in American patriotism and culture. But uh, before we get to that, um, what are you guys drinking? Um, well, so please, Laura. No, well, no, 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 please. Not very exciting, um, but I am drinking Kirkland brand sparkling water, <laughs> the grapefruit flavor, and that's mm. that's it. Although if things take a turn, I have a flask of um, uh, Red Bull in here. So you know if, if <laughs> things or no, what is not Red Bull? What is it? Fireball. You know the like bougie cheap bad whiskey with some cinnamon yeah. in it. So yeah, no, that's, that's my go-to if I have to take a shot, but I, I thought I'd better just, better just keep it on an even keel. So I've got, I've got my, uh, got my sparkling water. Okay. Well, you know, we were, we were talking about how many bad history takes there have been just this week. So we hope you don't have to dip into that flask too early. Uh, but we, we might get there. So um, I myself today, I'm, I'm drinking um, some whiskey. I'm drinking some rye, actually. Um, it's this lovely uh, redemption rye, um, a little bit spicier than, than a traditional bourbon. Um, and it does have the ice cube in it. I apologize, Varsha, but you know, we've, we've made our peace with, with that difference. Um, so, so very smooth and very lovely. I also have in the, the background there, I have some Amaro, um, so, uh, this Brolio kind of Alpine Amaro, which I've mentioned in previous episodes, which I might dip into later on. So what about you, Varsha? What are you drinking? I am, in the spirit of being a patriot, I am drinking Michter's American whiskey. And the reason it's called American is because they can't technically call it bourbon because they haven't made it in new bar barrels. So that's why they, they brand it American. So if you see anything called American whiskey, it's basically bourbon. Um, and so uh, I am also breaking my rule and I'm drinking it with ice because it's really, really hot outside. Um, but I'm also, mm. I like this version even better than Mixture's actual bourbon because it's like a little bit sweeter than their actual bourbon. So pretty good. Oh. Okay, fantastic. So I know you've been yeah. a big fan of Mixture's for a while. So I mean, this is this is high yeah. praise for you if this is this is better yeah. than their, their bourbon. Yeah. So, um, so I guess we should talk about history. I mean, we'll get to, to the nub of it. So, um, Laura, thank you so much for, for joining us today, especially, I mean, we didn't know this would be such a train wreck of bad history takes, um, though, of course, 
we'll get to talking about the White House um, conference on American history. Um, but uh, but you're currently work at another project, right? Um, something about Stanford and Western civilization. Could you could you tell yeah. us a little bit about what, what's going on there? Sure. This this is a, a project to kind of revise and expand what my dissertation was, and and I I landed a book contract fairly quickly after after um, graduating with with my dissertation with my wonderful patient blessed editor at uh, University of North Carolina Press who's who has been patient all the way and I've been very worried because I haven't yet turned in you know ta-da the manuscript but I, I've only I'm only five years out of my dissertation so I, I've decided not to freak mm -hmm. out so much um, and my research is really taking me in a deeper direction than I thought I think if I had stayed focused on what I started with which was this debate in the 1980s over whether or not Stanford University changing its um, core reading list for its kind of mm. Western culture class to include works by women and minorities, was that the downfall of Western civilization? I mean, that was a live question. And um, uh, what Stanford did, which is, which is on the face of it, a pretty minor curricular change, was given huge cultural significance. Dinesh D'Souza wrote a chapter on it in a liberal education. Um, uh, uh, can't remember his first name. See, this is terrible. I have to Google things. The tax guy for Ronald Reagan, Kemp, the senator, you know, oh, read about oh. it from the floor of the Senate as an example of how funding for higher education was a waste. And so it, it really became a cultural touchstone for people who had an ax to grind about, um, about taking a stand against uh, multiculturalism and for the, the neoconservatives and people like Sidney Hook um, for taking a stand against student activists. So that, you know, it's, it's a very, it, it's, a, it's a great time capsule from the 1980s. And I was able to look, at, have been able to look at it as kind of a great case study in um, the back channel conversations that happen about changing college curriculum and the personal stakes that are involved for professors, because the public do, never sees that part. You know, they see the, a, a, sure. if they see anything at at all there's some newsworthy change or a course name has changed um, but behind the scenes in every department of every college all the time are um, are different schools within the university desperately competing to have a share of the general education hours because the you know if you have a, if you have you know six hours or 12 hours of that general ed chunk no matter how big it is that that's guaranteed butts and chairs for your department and that funds, mm -hmm. you know, that, that allows the professors to teach the upper div classes and funds grad students and all that stuff. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, boringly quotidian stuff about curricular change and the reasons behind it often have to do with finance rather than with mm -hmm. some massive, you know, cultural shift. But what I've been learning as I've been doing the, you know, kind of, working on how I'm going to frame this is that what interests me most is the history of the idea of Western civilization, mm -hmm. which is not that, which is not that no old an idea. It's just the concept of Western civilization. When did people start talking about what did they mean by that? You know, what, what was Western civilization um, as a concept and when did people start using it and what were the different ways it was used and how did that multiplicity of meanings get dragged into the college curriculum to symbolize you know the best that has been thought and said or something along those lines so that's that's the section I'm working on now which is really fun because I get to read um, you know novels from the 1840s and 1850s which is so much more fun than curricular reports from the 1970s. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. when this is all finished is, I don't know, yeah. I just, at this, some point the, the, little, the little switch will click in my head and I'll be like, ah, off we go. So I don't know. Well, as a, as a department chair, right, let me, let, me, let me also say like five years out from your dissertation, like not being done with the book, that's totally mine. So it's not- Okay, I'm relieved. Yeah, <laughs> let me offer my 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 uh, my my uh, 
for my statement there. Um, I'm curious too, I mean, like maybe this befits um, um, someone who edits the, the United States Intellectual History blog, right, is like these ideas, right, is, right. you know, the big thing about this, this concept of Western civilization, which people have such an attachment to, um, right, um, you know, oftentimes as a political hammer, like you were saying, sure. kind of against academia, um, but even, you know, and maybe this is kind of a jump to, to more recent things, like this idea of patriotic history, these ideas that kind of underpin, um, you know, that, 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 that conference, with quotes mm -hmm. around it at the National Archives is like the attachment to these ideas, which are very easily easy to demonstrate are invented and, and have a history right. themselves, but but really stir people, right? So how does that like how do you how do you convey that 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 these ideas actually matter and they make people do things? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. And Western civilization, it's so funny. When I when I first talked to my advisor about, you know, this is I think, you know, asked him, is is this an interesting idea for a project? Um, and the the answer was an unequivocal yes. And then I I think I said in a follow up email, um, have I missed the wave on <laughs> talking about Western civilization? <laughs> and he wrote back something like, I, yeah, I don't think so. I have not missed the wave. I am so yeah. tired of the wave. It's just like wave <laughs> upon wave upon <laughs> like every time this this White House History Conference happened, and I was like, I I got to talk to my editor. I mean, these people are now in the these people are now somewhere in the end of my book with their yeah. weird thing that they're doing here. And um, it, it, it is kind of, it's amusing in a way um, and frustrating that people will get riled up about, like in the 80s, uh, people writing letters to the editor in newspapers all over the country uh, in little tiny towns in, in Missouri, say, were outraged at changes to the Stanford curriculum. And I'm thinking, A, you know, who really, besides a small number of students who go to that school, who really cares? Um, and, and also, in, it's Stanford. Right. Well, and this is part <laughs> of this, it, this is part of the go skewing bears. of, of, uh, of um, higher education reporting so that, you know, all the, the only schools people ever hear about are Yale, Stanford, Princeton, Harvard, maybe NYU once in a while, University of Chicago when they want to throw a bone past the Mississippi, I mean, you know, yeah. Berkeley, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's always a little handful of schools that shape uh, national journalistic coverage, usually because the alumni from those schools are overrepresented in the ranks of um, journalistic offices, right? So um, you make a hop from the Stanford Daily to the, to, the, to the New York Times or whatever, and then that's your go-to higher ed source. So yeah, th there's a lot of over-focus on, on elite schools. And what happens with that over-focus is an elite school like Stanford or Yale makes a change or you know, uh, institutes a multicultural requirement. And then um, polemicists take that and leverage that change to argue for less funding for non-elite schools, right? Stanford didn't suffer, <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody think, you know, at the time, and I was a student there, I have full disclosure, so I was uh, like a participant observer in these debates at the time they were happening. Um, and at the time people predicted, I mean, Thomas Sowell wrote a, wrote a column saying, stop giving to your alma mater, don't give any more money to this school, this, this you know, this school's a waste. Um, what, what is it, 30, 30 years later, Stanford's doing just fine. Stanislaus State, on the other hand, or the Cal State system, maybe not so much. So, so that, that's how those things work. And um, the same thing for the history conference, um, which, I mean, it was egregious in so many ways. And I hope we can talk about all the ways in which it was egregious. Because it I have really, all the time in the world. So. <laughs> I really, you know, I was just kind of, you know, making that Michael Scott cringe face. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. And then I saw, just like as the, pan, the, the camera panned accidentally, I saw um, Wilfred McClay. And I'm, I'm like on Twitter going, oh, my God, Bill McClay's at this thing. I can't believe it, you know. And because he's, he's for American intellectual historians, a well-known and pretty well-respected scholar 
So the first thing yeah. I did when that conference was over, the first thing I did before I even poured my drink down the sink was <laughs> I, I mean, I, <laughs> oh, I wrote him an email <laughs> and asked him if he would like to come to the U.S. Intellectual History blog and explain himself. I didn't put it in exactly those terms, yeah. but I was like, you know, our readers would be very interested to know I said something along the lines of, you know, this is a, an administration that's historically demonstrated kind of an anti-intellectual bent and not, not one that seems to have a high regard for science or research or empirical evidence. And, you know, as a historian and intellectual historians, I think our readers would, would love to know what it was that, that persuaded you that this would be a good place to you know um for you to um, participate um because we all saw david blight's tweet right <laughs> i mean when david blight the it, and i'm i was trying to explain this to my family and they're just not getting it because you know i mean <laughs> it's like it, I don't know, it would be like if, if the Pope made a Twitter account so he could drag you for no, something. Can you imagine being the reason that David Blight joined Twitter? Just to, make, just to yeah. complain about you? To tell you that you had profaned the National Archives. That's what he said in his tweet. He's about Alan yeah. Gelzo. He's like, you have helped profane the National And I'm like, you are not living your right, life right. If that's, if that's <laughs> happening to you as a historian, you have taken a bad turn. So anyway, yeah. I, God, I can't even remember. So yeah, the first thing I did was, was ask uh, him to, to write for the blog. And I'm working on putting a round table together. We'll see how that goes. But I noticed that it was really interesting. More, I think, and I wasn't counting, there were more mentions of Howard Zinn than there were about the 1619 project in that whole panel, as I thought about more explicit mentions of Howard Zinn. But the people who, you know, the people who watched that or who read my piece in Slate about it, um, they will send, and they did send to me, outraged emails about the 1619 Project. And it's so yeah. clear that they didn't read it, look yeah. at it, don't even know what it is, don't even know what its arguments are, what its purpose is, you know, complaining about the author of the 1619 Project. And I'm like, you didn't even turn the page far enough to know that was a, a collection of essays? What, you know? Yeah. So, um, these become, these are ginned up talking points for people to f focus on. And there is a, um, there's a great work on this. Um, th there is a kind of alternate economy of academic legitimacy that operates alongside the prestige economy, right? We all know about the Cokelings at various institutions who have, you know, the Coke funded chairs of this and that. Um, and um, the, the little peer review journals that they that they put out, right? So what, where they're where they're reviewing each other's work. And this is this is part of a, a 40 plus year old strategy um, that's very well funded on um, by right wing donors to legitimize ideas that on their own weren't able to make it in the marketplace of ideas. Right, you know, there's a, there's a lot of complaining about, oh, academia is so liberal and blah, 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 blah. And one of my friends on Twitter put it, you know, part of the marketplace ideas of ideas, if you want to insist on that as a way of framing, is that people might not want to buy your idea. And if it's a crappy <laughs> idea, people aren't going to buy it, right? So um, that conference was not aimed at historians, clearly, not aimed at scholars. Um, not aimed at the usual kinds of things that we aim at when we put together a conference, which is robust discussion or, you know, making sure that there's someone on that panel who brings an alternate view so that, that we can bring ideas into, into um, uh, a contrast with each other. So to, to call it, a, I, I would rather they help, called it a commission or a panel or a committee than a conference because nobody conferred, nobody thought anything through. It was this, this kind of um, organized, and it was organized temporally. That was really interesting. You know, they started with Howard Zinn as the source of all evil and, and then moved forward to the 1619 Project. 
Um, so I just, it, it was embarrassing in a lot of ways, I think, for, for the historical profession to have, to have that, that panel of, of, you know, in some cases, not even historians and, and, and then Ben Carson sitting there, like, you know, befuddled and, and, uh, I don't know what, I, I don't know what, <laughs> I mean, he, he was just kind of sitting there in the middle of it all, just looking dazed and confused. And um, then he intervened, but, you know, at the start of the Q&A by saying that he believes the Constitution is a divinely inspired document that should not be altered. Yeah. So, and I'm like... Uh, oh. <laughs> That broke me. No, hearing that really broke mm. me. And so like bringing this back to the root of all evil as they framed it, for people who might not know, why don't people like Howard Ben? Like, right. what's the be deal? Um, and I have to confess, I haven't read Howard Zinn. So, so if you're worried about Howard Zinn's deep influence in the profession of history, among all the books back there, he's not there because I, I, it's. But but I understand the. It's a people's history of the United States, and it's written from a social history perspective and a heavily Marxist perspective, and um, basically, you know, it's it's history from below along the lines that Jesse Lemish, rest his soul, um, you know, championed. And um, from what I know from you know, I mean, I, I really can't say much about the contents because it's 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 secondhand. But I know the the political stance. I know that it is used by some professors, not many. I mean, I don't know any. I don't. I think I have one colleague maybe who assigns portions of Howard Zinn. Um, it's used in the same way that the book Lies My Teacher Told Me is used. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it, for most. You know, for mo for most historians, it, I I don't think it it's a very I don't know I I'm not a Marxist I'm not even on the left I'm just kind of this bourgeois liberal so you know I don't I don't I don't I don't wouldn't find any any good use for Howard Zinn as far as I know but the thing that they were critiquing and pointing to was the Zinn Education Project which has all these very nicely packaged, you know, um, single lessons on different parts of history. Now, you know, I hate to break it to anybody, but just because Howard Zinn is a Marxist doesn't mean that, you know, uh, the, the, um, the facts and events and, you know, basic yeah. uh, structure of things he's analyzing is, is, is going to be somehow tainted. Um, but, but anyway, the, it seemed to me that the, the attack on Howard Zinn was partly to say there's an entire curriculum of Marxism that is being pushed in the schools. And yeah. instead of that, we have Bill McClay's book with an entire curriculum. Well, you know, I think that was one of the really interesting pieces you, you brought, uh, really interesting points, I should say, in your, your slate piece, your wonderful slate piece, is that, you know, it became that the conference was in some ways a conference, sorry, I have to keep doing that, um, was like this advertorial for, um, for Bill McClay's like new textbook. And, you know, like, like, um, you know, you mentioned Advarsha, you brought up too, is there's, it wasn't actually so much about history as about historians, right? Yeah. It was, it was an attack upon the, 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 the way that historians study the past using kind of the boogeyman of Zinn and um, Nicole Hannah-Jones's kind of 1619 uh, helmed, I should say, 1619 mm -hmm. project as the way of doing this. As, and, and with the undercurrent, as you mentioned, of uh, really a, a discussion about the way that history education is done in the schools and a fear on their part that it's indoctrinating, right? That, that Marxism and God forbid African-Americans and Native Americans be, be inserted into the curriculum. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I am, and this 17, I don't know what it is, 1776 Commission Project Committee yeah. uh, Propaganda Team, I don't know what it, uh, you know, <laughs> but, but it, it's really, um, it was really chilling to, and I used the word chilling twice in that slight piece, yeah. to hear uh, the president stand up and say that the Constitution was the culmination of a thousand years of Western civilization. That thousand year Reich idea was, you know, rattling around in, in, in his rhetoric, certainly. 
and um, the idea that if you know the you know, if you know the truth about your country, you can't love your country. You know, if you know, you know, if you know the truth about your family, you can still love your family. In fact, you can usually love your family a little bit better if you know where people are really coming from. And, you know, the idea that somehow um, to think about, um, it, you know, this, the whole point of the 1619 Project is, you know, what would it look like if we looked at all of American history through the perspective of um, uh, the beginning of chattel slavery and, and through the perspective of Africans and uh, people of African descent who, who played a central role in history, certainly, um, but have never been, never been accorded that, that place in the story we've been telling. It's, uh, historians do that all the time. You know, what uh, Heather Cox Richardson just wrote a book, you know, how the South won the Civil War, right? And, and her, she's doing that. What if, what if we consider our current state as a sign of Confederate victory, not Confederate defeat? I think these are really fruitful kinds of questions. And um, people who are bothered by historians asking questions aren't going to be happy with any history. They're, they're looking for something else. They're looking for fairy tales. Yeah. I guess, so I did, I did a very um, smaller version of what you're doing in the sense that I looked at history education in Thatcherite Britain for my undergrad thesis, and I found like similar patterns, <laughs> right? So what's happening in Thatcherite Britain in the 1980s, late 1970s in England is basically England, Britain is losing its empire. It's on its last legs when it comes to its actual imperial strength. And because it's on its last legs, there is a revitalization of not just um, rethinking how to teach social history, specifically the history of people who fought in World War One and Two, which is very serious for British people, but also rethinking how to teach the history of Britain as a nation. And so even in, I think this is in Thatcher's own autobiography, if not, she said it a few times, she wanted to put the great back into Great Britain. Very similar to what people assume that a lot of people want to do when it comes to history education in the United States. So I guess my, my question is, when it comes down to it, um, does your research on uh, this crisis in Stanford, as well as this general trend on critiquing how historians do history and how we teach history, does it tell you anything about why certain people want to basically whitewash certain aspects of history? Like, I know the answer seems obvious, but is there like a deeper reason here? Does it accomplish something else besides getting people to vote Republican one day or not? Right. That, that's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm really... I, I would say for people who feel deeply menaced or threatened or disrespected or disregarded because historians are including um, the voices and experiences of Black Americans and Native Americans and genderqueer Americans and, and women and, and immigrants, so, you know, I would say I am so sorry that you were given before such a flat, thin, fragile idea of um, America and American greatness. I mean, this is, this is the nation that, that, gave, um, that gave Negro spirituals and jazz to the world. Now, this nation as a quite dominated nation, gave, you know, if you, if you think about it that way, the, these, these rich artistic traditions came out of suffering and struggle. Um, but they're American, and they are as thoroughly American as the Declaration of Independence. There is no, um, uh, uh, if, if you read um, uh, Michael Twitty's uh, cookbooks that are also history books about Southern cuisine and about the amazing, the amazing rich gift that African chefs and, and cooks brought with them as, as they came to these shores. I mean, I just, I feel sorry for anyone who looks at the um, amazing diversity and richness. I mean, what a rich um, cultural milieu we are here. 
that that you can go uh, into New York City or San Francisco or even the suburbs where I live in North Dallas and find cuisine from all over the world. I mean, it's just the, the, this is a a um, I just feel bad for people whose whose views are so blinkered and and who are so threatened by the loss of a story where only white men have anything great to to contribute or do and um i think it's compensatory i think a lot of people you know um in the same reason that study of genealogy can be compensatory for some people people are mm. deeply proud of you know my ancestors did this or my ancestors did that my ancestors came over on the mayflower or, or whatever um or you know my ancestor was a great civil war general or, or whatever um and and want to be proud of the 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 people from their past but um I, I think I think that what we owe the dead is not to blindly praise them, but to understand them, right? I mean, um, I I just think it's so silly to 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 as what's his face Arn, the president of Hillsdale College, you know, began his introduction of this panel with contending for the fact that you know clearly Thomas Jefferson wasn't a hypocrite because. <laughs> Because he favored limiting slavery, uh, uh, sl slavery spread to the Northwest Ordinance. And I thought, is the question ever really that Thomas Jefferson was or wasn't a hypocrite? Isn't the question, what, what do we as Americans do with the, with the deep inner conflict of this soaring beautiful rhetoric that has shaped the, the human rights movements of, of people all over the world from the moment it was written, from the, that has contributed to the, the language and the ideas of, of uh, revolutionaries, of abolitionists, of women's rights activists all over the world. I tell my students when, when we hear the Declaration of Independence and when people point to that, they're pointing to the, the vision of what America is supposed to be. And that's the text, you know, William Lloyd Garrison loved the Declaration of Independence, couldn't stand the Constitution. You know, the, the question is always, how is it that the man who wrote that and believed it also justified the holding property in persons? And what can we understand in that, you know, in that, deep interpersonal conflict that's also indicative of a deep national conflict. Um, it's not a simple cheap shot, oh, he was a, he was a hypocrite because he owned slave, but, but you know, what, what does this mean? And what does this mean for us? And what does it mean that, that you know, the, 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 the phrases of the Declaration of Independence ring like a bell, like a clear bell through all the, all the generations of, of, America, of America's story? And we have to hear those undertones, or we've uh, we've done a just uh, a disservice to Thomas Jefferson. He deserves to be understood, not just you know quoted selectively, but de but deeply understood because, you know, people only get one life, and I think the dead, rather than being remembered and revered, probably really you know if the dead wish for anything, would be grateful to, that somebody f that did their best to understand them and um that's just i don't know that's where i am on yeah. things so if i could ask you know one question and i'm, I'm going to try to tie it together a few threads here but i'm on like drink three so we'll see how it goes um and then we'll, we'll get to some because we have some really wonderful Do i need to walk from, you guys home or something when this is over <laughs> The, the great thing about this show, Laura, is I'm in my house. So whatever, yeah, right? right? Like, it's great. My anyway, bed is uh, five feet that way. Okay. Just <laughs> phone a friend. We're fine. Yeah, that's right. Um, so and uh, so 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 you know, you mentioned, for example, um, uh, the, one of the panelists on in the White House History Conference was the president of Hillsdale College. Um, ben Carson was there, and so the undertone of religion. Right, and specifically Christian mm -hmm. nationalism, that that kind of undergirded this. And I think that I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, just a little bit about that. Is like, how do you see that kind of understanding this, or, 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 or 
kind of underpinning this patriotic understanding of, of American history. Because I mean, one of the things that, you know, we've seen repeatedly through this administration is, is the elision of white supremacy and Christian nationalism, right? And so here it's a particular narrative of history that justifies that particular vision. Right. Absolutely. And, and um, what's so, um, it would be funny if it weren't so sad, is, is that that vision, Ben Carson's vision, and that, that Hillsdale College vision, and perhaps, I don't know, perhaps to some extent, um, Bill McClay's vision. I, I haven't read the book yet, so I don't want to judge that. And I, and I will say that um, McClay is widely and well and rightly known as a, as a, as a, um, as a gifted writer and a, and a perceptive historian of American thought and culture. So I'm, I'm very curious, you know, <clears throat> how comfortable and, you know, how well his book actually fits with the 1776 commission, but I'm afraid that it does, or he wouldn't been, wouldn't have been mm -hmm. there. But that, that vision of Christian nationalism is of course, utterly incompatible with the vision of the enlightenment that other people were holding up you know mm -hmm. the great and i think alan gelzo was was on his you know with his with his um theatrical voice and his deep rolling baritone was you know quoting shakespeare to hear it bounce off the halls of the national archives or whatever and i think he was making a brief for the enlightenment that here's you know thomas jefferson the great enlightenment thinker and you know at the end of my slate piece i thought you know Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, they are rolling over in their graves, rolling in their graves to hear Ben Carson say that the Constitution of the United States is divinely inspired and should not be changed. Because that, that, that idea of, of, um, of, of um, <clears throat> divine authority underwriting our human government yeah. is, is, is completely in contrast to the most important, I always teach my students, this is the most radical phrase in the Declaration of Independence. Governments are established among men deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. Not from, not from God, not from the divine right of kings, not from the Pope, not from any other system ever of government ever known to these to these men who drafted this document, but but that that the power comes from and authority comes from the people. It is it is not. Um, it, it's so incompatible. This Christianized vision of American history, where America is here to fulfill God's purpose and you know be part of the end times or whatever. This Christian dominionism that that Mike Pence is so embroiled in, and that. Uh, <clears throat> I just saw someone quoting uh, the uh, the pastor of First Baptist Dallas. I think was on Fox News tonight. You know, arguing about Jeffress, uh, yeah, yeah, Robert Jeffress. Yeah, that that is, you know, that's one way that some people tell the story. And I think uh, John Thea has done a pretty good job of 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 intervening in that narrative among you know Christian readers of history. Um, that's I think that's his basic audience. That's one way to tell the story, but it's not. Um, it it in no, it is in no way compatible with a story that foregrounds the thinking of Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, mm. uh, Franklin, and and Madison, frankly, or even John Adams. Though you know, John Adams. Um, props to my friend Sarah Giorgini for her wonderful book on the Adamses. You know, he doesn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but so uh, speaking. No, please go ahead. Yeah. I have to give an infomercial. Okay, so <laughs> you know, right, we are right in the middle of things that the Society for U.S. Intellectual History, we were going to have our conference in Boston, the, you know, a, a, a flashpoint of the American Revolution, and my colleague Sarah Giorgini has planned it, but now we're going virtual. It's all online, and it's free, and so I want to encourage anyone who might be interested in any of the events to go to our website, s-usih.org slash conference, and um, you can register for any event. And our first plenary is coming up on Monday night, so. And, and that's a real conference. I don't even have to put square quotes. <laughs> yeah. scare quote it's, it's not so, a scare yeah. quote conference. No, no. these are, this is, a, this is a real exchange of ideas and we'll have the same format that we have here where people can ask questions. So. And I just like building, like going back to the point about Christian dominionism, I just have to teach my students about the Great Awakening. We spent two weeks reading a great collection of documents. Um, it's actually here. 
Uh, it's uh, by Thomas Kidd, mm -hmm. and he's an evangelical himself, right? And it's a great collection of documents. And after finishing the documents, I asked my students, you know, why is it the Great Awakening has an influence on the American Revolution? And that's a better way to think about the role religion plays in the American Revolution, because just because I say, or just because it's true that Jefferson and other founding fathers had deeply believed in not deriving their, you know, their uh, sovereignty from God doesn't mean religion played no role, right? No. Because a lot of these evangelicals during the First Great Awakening, which is, you know, during the 18th century, what they're talking about is like individual liberty and choosing your own faith in God or choosing your own path towards God. And so, the, and the relying really on your own. Me, relying on your own yeah. experience as a as a yeah. guide to you know that empiricism that fundamental empiricism that's so that's so crucial yeah i my favorite thing to teach in the survey is american religious history i mean that's when i'm really on a roll you know when i don't have to yeah that's when i can just just roll with it and and i love helping my students understand how important religion has been in american history but important historically is not the same as divinely inspiring our history. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what bothered me about the con the conference is that they assume things about what historians do without ever picking up a book about what historians have actually written. Because there are, there are no historians out there who would waste two hundred pages and you know years in grad school to write to come up with the conclusion. Thomas Jefferson was a hypocrite. Therefore, that's the only thing we should teach our students about Thomas Jefferson. Because uh, I mean, there's, there was a great, um, I'm plugging something I did, but it was mainly like a really cool interview I had with Nicole Hemmer a long time ago. And I asked her about Thomas Jefferson because she did a great podcast on Charlottesville when it happened, right? And she said like, the most important thing about Jefferson is exactly what you said, Laura, is that it's interesting to look at how he is a man of contrast just as almost every single white slave owner in Virginia during that time was also a man of contrast because they are dealing with an empire from above while basically colonizing an empire below, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I have the same problem. I think the um, one thing that students really struggle with, I think even in high school, is like reconciling this idea of manifest destiny and American exceptionalism mm -hmm. with their own idea of America as being great. Right, because see the shining sea sounds more menacing um, after you take that class. And so I, I, I feel like you know what you just said about America being like this, having this real cultural heritage, points to the fact that it's okay to speak about the bad things in American history. That doesn't mean that you're not patriotic. And I think that's what that's really ticked me off about about the, the conference. This would probably decim. De decimate it's not the right word disappoint some of my colleagues but i really i really am a rather <laughs> embarrassingly patriotic um historian i i gravitated to american history because i have a, a deep um reverence for the particular form of government that i mean for this just crazy ramshackle experiment that has that has you know not perfect but it but is still apparently functioning it's to some degree it's a couple hundred years later this is this is a this is a story that i'm a part of just by virtue of where i'm born people become part of the american story um and america becomes part of other people's stories as people interact all over the world you know and and um, it's a story whose ending remains to be written. And yeah. Yeah. I, I love to think of, you know, I love to think of the, the blank page in front of us. And you, you cannot, I mean, just think of, think of the Bleak House or, or, or Middlemarch or one of those fantastic Victorian novels where every single end is, you know, every single thing is tied up into a beautiful ending. Um, it, it is possible that we can all of us if we listen to each other and that means kind of foregrounding the voices that haven't been heard so that haven't been listened to so well in the past if we listen to each other we we may very well be able to write a better end to the story than it than the one that seems on the on the horizon now and um but you can't do that if you ha if you haven't if you're not 
if you're not familiar with the twists and turns of the plot, and there have been a lot of twists and turns in the American story that are that are deeply unsettling and and really quite um, quite tragic and regrettable, and and if we can't if we can't see that and say even so, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my faith in this collective experiment to make make the world better than we found it, then then you're really missing out. You know. Yeah. Oh, I fully agree. And I'm, I'm a naturalized citizen, right? So the first thing I did when I went to DC for the first ever time, which was back in 2017, uh, I went to the National Archives. I had a much different experience than the so-called conference <laughs> because I went and I saw, I, I saw the room where they have the Declaration, the Constitution, yeah. the Bill of Rights. And I like, I could feel myself being transported to 1787. And like, obviously I knew if I was actually transported back then I wouldn't be allowed in Independence Hall, but still like it was an yeah. amazing experience. And like a lot of people after I told them that were like, Barsha, it's just a piece of paper. In fact, I have like a friend who's a lawyer who's like, you know, I've, I've read it before. I don't need to see it. And I was like, that's, that's not how I feel about it though. Right. But at the same time, I still, I'm going to be active in telling my students that there is not only a dark underbelly to this, but there is a more complicated story to this. Mm -hmm. Like my motto, I should be tattooed on my forehead, is that it's much more complicated than that. Oh, <laughs> historians, we are, we are the bane of any questioner. Well, it's complicated, <laughs> but but it is complicated. But no, I the last time I was in D.C., I went into um, the Smithsonian and I saw, you know, the the the, the flag that flew over Fort McKinley, the the Stars and Stripes, and of course we all know how how deeply problematic the lyrics of the national anthem are. And I teared up. I tear up when I go into the National Archives. I mean, this is, you know, this and, and you know, I believe me, I've been well indoctrinated to love my country and I really do um, what and my students have as well, but they have not been taught to understand it. And um, and I think the better they understand it, the better they can help it. That's just yeah. that's just how I would approach teaching history. So if I could, um, I, I'm going to combine, like we've been kind of talking about a few of the questions that have been put in Q&A already, um, you know, but if I could kind of combine a couple of things is that one of the, somebody points out, you know, th one of the things that's interesting about the White House conference on history is the presidential involvement, right? And the fact that, that, that President Trump himself was there. And so like, is that a history? And then I, I want to kind of combine that with another question because shortly after that, right, he put out an executive order about um, banning critical race theory, which these things seem to be of a piece in which there's an assault on the idea coming directly from the executive about mm -hmm. the idea of, of academia and specifically about the study of the past, like us as, as historians and, and having kind of alternative viewpoints and stuff like that. So like, what do you think, like how do you, A, is there, is there a precedent for this in, in kind of your own research, you know, going back to the kind of Stanford Western Civ mm -hmm. controversy, but also like, like, what are your thoughts kind of going forward from here in which, like you were just saying, like, we don't study this stuff necessarily because we hate things or because we hate our country in some way, but because we're, we're interested in telling the full story of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the president's presence there was, um, I mean, probably not, I'm, I'm trying to think, I mean, yeah, uh, the, the closest, analog that I can come to is um, George H.W. Bush in 1991, in the spring of 1991, he gave a, a commencement speech at University of Michigan and he talked about the, the epidemic of political correctness. And there had been a, a, you know, a Time Magazine article, I think, uh, about political correctness a few months before, but you know, not every American household reads Time Magazine. But at that point, amazingly, and this is something I have to explain to my students, okay, if you didn't have cable, TV had three channels, okay? <laughs> and if you did have cable, there were like, you know, maybe five news channels total. It wasn't like it is today where you get your news from anywhere. So people probably saw the news coverage or read in their newspapers. And I, I actually teach my students how to read a newspaper because it's not, it's a material yeah, artifact no, that people don't yeah. use anymore. Um, that that really put that idea of political correctness 
on that I mean that that idea of political correctness this this whole I mean I think the panelists mentioned cancel culture in passing and it was mm -hmm. as if they thought you know let's complain about co political correctness some more that seemed to work before but ah, we got to come up with a new phrase for it and cancel culture you know that works but it's the same it's the same beef it's the same old complaint that somehow um, somehow being asked to to not use racist slurs when talking about people you're in the same room with is infringing on your right to free speech as opposed to you know asking you to be a decent person in community with other people mm -hmm. so um you know presidents have it have, yeah and george hw bush is just the one that comes to mind for for what i'm studying but um it's it's I think it's it's insulting and embarrassing. I mean, I think that's why David Blight, you know, he said in his infamous tweet, you know, <laughs> he was mad about this whole presidential, you know, this patriotic history. I mean, that's that's straight out of fascist Europe. You know, yeah. you're going yeah. to learn the patriotic story of of the great blonde, you know, Uberman. Ubermenschen. I'm sure that's how it is in German. <laughs> and uh, that that's that's not you know, to hear that coming from the executive and then have that followed with this, um, this assault on freedom of inquiry at college campuses is pretty chilling. It's very chilling. I mean, and I, my kids are my, bless my kids' hearts. They're both in their twenties and they're, very, they know me and they're very patient with me. But I was, I was channeling my grandmother who, who was a, she was a second Lieutenant in the U S army in world war II. And she was just a, a formidable woman. And I, I said, you know, one of these days they're going to ask us to sign loyalty oaths. I mean, how far are we from from certifying or verifying that we are teaching patriotic education and that we're not using critical race theory if our if our colleges want to get funding? And you know, I told my kids, I'm not signing shit. I'm, I'm not <laughs> signing a loyalty oath. Uh, you know, they can drag me out of my. They can just drag me out and throw me away. I'm not going to do it. Varsha, do they still do that at Berkeley? Because when I was a GTA, a graduate student assistant at, at Berkeley in the 90s, like I had to sign a loyalty oath. Right. I don't think they technically have the loyalty oath anymore, okay. but I, I do remember it being a thing. Like I think it was a thing time, recently. You to, yeah, you had to sign saying that you were loyal to the United States. And I remember one of my favorite stories comes from one of the first grad, grad seminars I took. Um, it was on the Constitution and its aims, and uh, the professor mentioned that for the longest time, the United uh, Berkeley had a chair of history, but uh, like the specific chair, I forget the name of the chair, but it could only be held because it was created during the Cold War period, like during the 1950s. It could only be held by someone who was loyal to the Constitution of the United States, and like, I mean, it's I that seems like innocuous enough, but it's also like, why'd you put that in there and like define? That seems weird. Oh, well, you know, I, honestly, so think, yeah, that kind of oath wouldn't bother me. I mean, I think I think probably naturalized citizens take an oath to the Constitution. Military yeah. officers take an oath to the Constitution. Yeah. You know, a, as an American citizen, I am I am I am very happy to affirm before God and everybody that that I have no ill designs on on my country and that I wouldn't you know attack it. Unlike say the entire freaking Confederate Army. You know, no, I, I, I will not be committing treason anytime soon. This is, but, but, you know, I really feel like we're at where the thought police are a little bit on, you know, all this, all this complaining about cancel culture and propaganda is a lot of projection. It's a lot of projection. Yeah. Um, what's yeah. really, what's really happening is a, a, a flattening and a thinning and a impoverishing of what questions people are going to be allowed to ask about the American past. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, all my students all the time, bless their hearts, they always say, well, we study the past so we can learn from it. Um, and, you know, maybe, I mean, we, that's a whole separate conversation. But <laughs> if, you know, if, if all, it's, it's like one of those survival games where you're locked in a room or something, or you're dropped on an island, and all you have to use is all the crap that happened in the past. You better look at it carefully and pick through every bit of it, because you may be missing the one thing that's going to solve the puzzle and help you, you know, mm. move on. You can't do that if you're only allowed to ask nice questions. 
Um, so speaking of nice questions, there is a really cool question from Sarah Giorgini, actually. Hi, Sarah. You're talking about newspapers. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about newspapers and how you teach your students to read newspapers. And oddly enough, um, I actually subscribed to like the physical copy of the Post and Times for a long time because I, for the longest time, was like, I don't actually know how to read these things. Um, so besides newspapers, what are your favorite kinds of primary sources to teach in your U.S. intellectual history class and why? Okay, well, newspapers are the top, the very top. And I always use newspapers in both ha halves of the survey. Um, but then I, I use, um, and there's a great post, by the way, at the U.S. Intellectual History blog from Ben Wright, who's the editor of the American Yop, and he has a list of like a hundred readings that you could that you could use if you were teaching an intellectual history survey. I love to use one of my favorite things to teach is um, the New Woman, and and mm -hmm. you know kind of the, the the emergence of these these changing ideas of gender and the Gilded Age and, and the Progressive Era, and so I, I use a lot of. Um, cartoons and kind of humorous or satirical drawings. I do the same for, yeah. you know, early American politics. And um, so, so the new woman and her bicycle, if my students remember nothing else about the second half of the survey, <laughs> they remember that the new woman rides a bicycle everywhere and, and, you know, and, uh, and dresses in, in increasingly uh, tomboy couture, you know, that's like, but, but I, yeah, I know, I know. It's, I use a lot of I use a lot of visual materials. I was I was telling um, I was telling Matt before we started that um, I'm really frustrated because teaching asynchronously means that I lose and my students lose all the fun of taking a visual text, which of course doesn't come with like cap, well, early cartoons do, but you know, it doesn't come with a key to interpretation and, and, you know, helping them figure out, okay, this is, this is a cartoon made in 1880. What are the things in it stand for? What does this even mean? How would I, if, you know, if this washed up on a beach and this was the only thing I had from 1880, what could I know about 1880 from this, mm -hmm. from this drawing? So I really, I really love doing that. But um, yeah, I'm a big um, newspaper junkie. And, um, and I always, we, I always spend more time on the advertising than anything else. Cause that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's where the, that's where the fun material culture stuff is. If no one has seen this, it's my favorite cartoon in American history ever, despite all of the amazing political cartoons in the late 19th century, The Drunkard's Progress. Mm -hmm. So this is from the temperance movement. Right. And it's the best thing ever. And it basically is like- Up the uh, stairs nine and then down steps. the stairs. Yeah. yeah, up the stairs and nine down the stairs of like a, a man and his progress towards alcoholism. And it's like, it's also like it's very important to understand why women and why people are supporting temperance at the time but it's fascinating to look at um and it's just great and i i agree that like one of the best things about american politics specifically in the 19th century uh is the willingness to draw cartoons and to be satirical about them i feel like that it's still prevalent today but it was like a really big like impact in the late 19th century. That's the best part about late 19th century American politics. Right, and the I way think. the way that um, newspapers circulated far beyond their subscribers to be read in you know read in the in the yeah. by the courthouse or in the bar or wherever. I will say, and this is you know I'm I'm drinking, you know. Kirkland LaCroix basically because just because I am and it's it's the way I hydrate I mean I don't even drink like real water I just drink sparkling water all day <laughs> like some kind of delicate flower or something but um, I will say when I when I started undergrad um, you know and I I, I started thinking I was going to be you know a great writer as as one does and I looked at the you know the great writers that I knew of and they were all white men, you know, it was, it was Robert Frost and Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner and F. Scott Fitzgerald. And, you know, what does it take to be a great writer? And I saw that, you know, my conclusion was what it takes to be a great writer is to, you know, be a drunkard, <laughs> drink a lot, you know, and, and, yeah. you know, cry in your cups and, and be deeply. And, and I, I worry sometimes, I think this format is great. Um, but one of the things I worry sometimes about for undergraduates, especially, is um, when they look at historians and how we work and how we talk, and this is a great format for doing that, 
I don't want them to get the idea that that to be a historian, you have to, you know, you have to drink a lot, right? You know, I, 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 <laughs> no offense, but I'm not saying that, but just because you were talking about the drunkard's progress and, and it is, and the temperance movement, I am not, I am not yeah. a teetotaler, believe me. Uh, anybody who's <laughs> seen me at a conference knows that I, I enjoy, I enjoy tossing a few back, but I just thought of that as I was thinking about whether or not I should have, you know, let my, my own students know that we were doing this class is that I, that I, that um, sometimes it's hard to separate the, the um, the accidents from the essence of what it means mm -hmm. to be a, right to be a, a, yeah. a scholar, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and um, I think what you guys are doing here is essential, not accidental, right? You know, the yeah. essential part is the conversation. The accidental part is the drinking. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> no, and I think oh, yeah. that, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things that we've tried to do a lot, you know, in this show with 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 the variety of our guests is to, to demonstrate that how accessible the past is. It's, yeah. it, it's not a caricature. It's mm -hmm. hard, but you can do it. Like we'll help you as teachers and as, um, you know, kind of uh, people who care about this stuff in order to understand the sources and the, 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 the scholarship that's, that's involved in this. And, and, you know, I think that's, that's, that's kind of animated us. And that's not just at the college level, that's, that's at K-12 level as well. Um, that's something that unfortunately, you know, we're, we're just about out of time and, but we didn't get a chance to talk about is this, the role of K-12 education in all of this as well, right? Because we're all confronted as, as the three of us here as, as college instructors, the students come to us with preconceived understandings of these particular periods and they're getting them um, from particular places. And, you know, K-12 educators are, are, exceptional hard workers and they they know this stuff and they're trying to do their best but sometimes they're dealing with as uh, laura you said earlier like with hostile school boards text well and they're they're and forced to teach to them. a test usually they're forced yeah. to teach to some yeah. kind of end of your competency test and i can tell you really quickly a feature about k-12 education in texas that i only learned a few years ago i told my friend from louisiana i said did you know that um, U.S. history instruction in uh, Texas high schools starts in 1877, and her response was, "Well, that's convenient because you know." For people who don't know, 1877 is yeah. the end, end. The, the beginning of the corrupt bargain. It's the end right. of reconstruction. It's the it's end of reconstruction. Right. So, and and uh, uh, that's on the nose. Apparently they get the first half of U.S. history in eighth grade or something like that. But I just thought that, so when I teach dual credit history to U.S., uh, to high school students, they're getting both halves of the survey. And that's more than uh, students who are not in an AP class would get, you know. But yeah, um, that history is just in, in high school, it's 1877 to present. That's the, that's the, the dividing line. And I, I, I find, so it's no wonder that students come to college having no conception of, um, you know, how, of the, of the, as we've yeah. talked about, the variety and the contentiousness with which America began. They just, it, it's not on their radar screen at all. No. I mean, absolutely. I'm writing a, I'm, this is like my last comment, but I'm like writing a very specific thing about America first as an ideology. And so if I picture a, a Texas high school student only getting the history of the United States from 1877 to the present, they're only getting a certain vision of American foreign policy as well as American like domestic policy. And that must really damage them as like civics citizens, you know, like that's like, that's one of the reasons I loved becoming like my citizenship day my naturalization ceremony was like a big blow up party. It was the first time I tried bourbon too. It was like great. <laughs> right? It was like I I got I got proper Kentucky bourbon bourbon. I like I wore like uh, American flag eye makeup. Like I was super into it. But also I had spent like the past five years, six years really deep into American history at the college level. Mm -hmm. And so if I had had not a great high school experience with US history, I don't know if I would have been as in love with the United States and being a citizen as I would be today. That's, I have that's students, super depressing to hear. I have students every semester who are in the class, not just because it's required, but who are studying for their citizenship test. And I always feel like, man, do I have a responsibility to get it right mm -hmm. for you. You know, I, I, I owe you this, right. As your, as your professor yeah. to, to, um, to give you the, as complete a picture as I can, but 
uh, it's hard in the pandemic. Not 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 fun. Teaching is 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 more difficult now. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I, I think we're we have to kind of wrap it up right here. Um, you know, we have a ton of other amazing questions that we just didn't have a a chance to get to. We didn't get a chance to talk about all the terrible history takes that racist colonialist thing in the spectator and uh, all the, the garbage in the national review about this patriotic history and just which it just defaces all the complexity and the interesting parts of, of studying the past and stuff like that. So, um, but, but thank you, um, uh, LD Burnett for, for joining us. Um, we're going to put, uh, I put the, the link to the conference in the, in the chat already. Thank you. Um, we'll send that out um, afterwards as well. Um, and uh, Varsha, I think you have an announcement about our next, guest perhaps i know okay so i'm super excited about our next guest mainly because i think the supreme court has sucked and has always sucked but uh keeping my bias aside um, our next guest let me i have his book right here actually because i was reperusing it after uh saturday's news uh it's called injustices by ian milheiser he is not an official historian but he did go to law school and this is technically a history book on the history of the supreme court and he's been inside the Supreme Court, like physically. He's reported on it for years. So he's gonna be here to talk to us about why Supreme Court is bad and should feel bad. Um, and generally <laughs> about legal history. Uh, we might get to ask him some really like burning questions that I have, which is um, what is Lochner v. New York? It's gonna be fun. Um, and the best part is you don't have to wait two, you don't have to wait two weeks for it. It's gonna be next Friday, so. No, we're we're so in love with our guests. We're doing another oh, episode just next week. It's gonna be it's gonna be absolutely yeah. amazing. So awesome. um, so please join us next week. Ian Milheiser from Vox Media. He wrote a book on, as Varsha just said, her words, not mine. How SCOTUS has sucked and will always suck. And we're gonna talk more about that. So, but thank you so much, LD Burnett, for joining us. Thank you everyone for spending your Friday evening with us. Um, until next week, let me simply say, cheers. Cheers.